Welcome to Tech Leaders Today with your host, Kathy Crossley. All comments, views, and opinions expressed on this show are strictly those of the host, guests, and callers. Now here's Kathy Crossley. I have with me on Tech Leaders Today, Kevin Parker. Kevin is an award-winning information management and technology leader working as a senior consultant for Neostech. Did I say that right, Kevin? Yes, you did. Great. An IT solutions provider supporting agencies within the U.S. federal government. Kevin is a regular conference and webinar speaker, and he teaches information management classes for AIIM, the Global Community of Information Professionals. Kevin is also president of the National Capital Chapter of AIIM in Washington, D.C. Thank you for joining me today, Kevin. How are you? Good. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to have you here. Uh, We connected on Twitter, and I have to say that what I've seen for what you've been putting out there has been uh, very informative. You have a good sense of what's going on in many different industries. Do you have a team or are you working a lot with clients? Right. So I'm the senior person for my company uh, with the particular client that I work with, which is Department of Justice. I also help our company. I I work directly for our CEO and I help her to recruit new talent for all of our uh, projects across a few different federal departments. Okay. So I want to take you to uh, something that uh, is near and dear to my heart is people and attracting them to our companies today. The job market that we have out there, there's a lot of need for various skill sets and attracting professionals and especially attracting the right professionals is a challenge sometimes. So can you tell me your experience and what you're going through with your company on attracting technology professionals? Right. So with Neos Tech, uh, I work directly with our CEO and we try to hire really quality professionals for a variety of contracts. So the way government contracting and information technology works is we respond to uh, RFPs that are put out by the government. We go and we uh, win a contract and then we have to staff that. So it it's really a, a very involved process. I spent a lot of years in the private sector. It was a lot simpler uh, in the private sector than it is with government specifically, but still you have a lot of the same problems. Information management problems are pretty much the same in any kind of human organization. And so what we're finding with the certain projects that we have, just like uh, with the private sector, is a lot of employers, or in our case, uh, government clients, have an idea of the type of professional that they want, and they may think that they know what the kind of project is that they need to to resolve whatever business problems that they've identified, but often they don't really know enough about what particular skill sets or types of people uh, really are needed to meet the needs that are they're trying to resolve it from a business perspective. And so it's really helpful. What I'm finding is um, being very involved with AIM International, as you mentioned, that's the Association of Information and Image Management. Uh, is in other organizations. I'm involved with Information Architecture Institute, Information Coalition, uh, ARMA, and a couple of other organizations, is seeing what they're identifying across their entire member base and in multiple industries for professionals and then translating that into well, what are the things that we're asking for. So it, it helps us not to just get very specific about, well, we need, for instance, we do a lot of SharePoint projects. We need a SharePoint developer and an admin. Well, maybe you need somebody who's an information architect, and maybe you need somebody who is a project manager who can help with the uh, change management issues that are involved with going from one system to another. So there's just so many things with the speed of digital transformation uh, today, you really have to work hard to stay on top of the types of skills that are needed to fulfill a, a certain obligation. Basically, it's a lot of work to keep up with what it is that we're needing to hire for and then to uh, keep those skills sharp. So you don't just hire somebody for a certain skill set in the types of work that we do and they stay there forever generally. I mean, if it's a database administrator, maybe, but even database technologies evolve and you have to continue to sharpen their skills. So we send people to training and we make sure that they can stay on top of whatever it is that they're uh, working on on their project teams. 
Do you generally find that, for example, SharePoint and the development needs that you have or the technology needs that you have, are they transferable as the platforms evolve? Uh, do you find people more niched in what they're doing at the lower levels and then as they graduate up to more information architects and project management or something at that level, then they move to other areas so that they broaden their knowledge? It's a really good question, and I would say my own journey to SharePoint was it was interesting. I had started out doing web content management and building websites and systems for public facing web sites for clients and for different organizations that I worked for, but also doing some internal enterprise content management stuff. And then SharePoint was just kind of thrust upon me. So what I learned in my quick and deep dive was that there are a lot of people who call themselves SharePoint developers who really are like .NET developers and they do certain things a certain way and they tend to get stuck. Like if you're a developer and you start from the .NET or the database and .NET side, you tend to see every solution through that lens. Whereas if you come like I did from the information architecture side and also change management, you want to try to leverage the platform as much as you can so that it can change over time and, and your sites don't all break and that kind of thing. Uh, the same thing, administrators tend to see things from you know, PowerShell scripting and that type of thing. How can I solve all my problems the way that I know how? There aren't a lot of people, I would say percentage-wise, that bounce around from the different skill sets. There, there is a, a percentage, and they're the ones that tend to be able to look at a situation, any kind of business problem, and it doesn't matter if it's SharePoint or any ECM-type system, but they can give you a more holistic view on what it would take to solve those business problems. But there's so many people, I would say the majority are, are very niche uh, in the sense of they see everything from whatever perspective they came to SharePoint with. And so it kind of gets stuck there sometimes. And, and getting them out of that is, is a real challenge. But also finding professionals that have done a variety of things even before SharePoint. I would rather have someone who has a variety of experience and a year of SharePoint skills than I would somebody who's done the same thing in SharePoint for the life of the product. Uh, you know, more than 10 years. I can uh, see how that happens. They need to be able to identify with business stakeholders and business teams. And uh, every time you were talking about that, I was thinking that saying that if you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. And uh, Absolutely. So that need, was in my yeah. mind as well. <laughs> yeah. So you need to really have that toolbox. And I agree. I like the variety Generally, when I'm looking for people, if they have a consultant background where they've worked with multiple clients, that's great. It gives a lot of exposure. Uh, if they've worked at a small company for 10 years where they've been very siloed or very specific on their areas, uh, they don't have that breadth that uh, allows them to jump to new challenges and activities. Absolutely. And so when I see somebody on their resume that has moved around every few years or a couple of years, that doesn't bother me when I look at the kind of work that they've done and then can talk to them about how that experience has helped them to be able to solve a lot more problems than somebody who necessarily, you know, may have had 10 years experience, like you said, at one company in a silo, or, you know, maybe they move around a lot from companies, but they're still in the same silo in every company. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes, unless we have very specific work that is just that, it is difficult to get them to branch out. Uh, but the ones that do, I think, are better for it for their career. But a lot of companies don't know how to hire people with multiple tools in their tool belt. They tend to look, okay, I have this problem, I want to hire this person, and then they wonder why they can't keep talent as the technology changes and the organization changes. Yes, absolutely. So you're located in Washington, D.C.? Correct. When you are looking for people, are you requiring them to have that background at least one time before in government, or what are the rules? I've not worked in the uh, government sectors. It helps if they have some government experience, but I've only been doing government contracting for a little over five years, and my first job had to be my first one. So somebody took a risk. They saw that, okay, this person has a consulting background. He's done a lot of work with enterprise content management, and he knows SharePoint that's who we need. I actually moved from halfway across the country here to work with a consultancy, uh, a previous company. But 
they took that chance. So what really the, the government's more concerned about, does the company have uh, past performance and are they hiring consultants that can do the job as opposed to every consultant has to have worked in government before? That's great. We're seeing that shift quite a bit. Having government treat their constituents as consumers or clients rather than constituents. And they really need to think outside the box and look for those different ways and approaches. And I'm sure you're probably seeing that in different government agencies now where they're trying to act more like a corporation or a regular business and really consulting with uh, the people who are going to use their products. Right. I, I think that there's such a need because this is the largest Single, if you take the U.S. government as a whole, I mean, it's a huge enterprise compared to any other organization on the planet. And there's so much information and there's still a lot in paper and there's just so much that needs to be done to improve technology. But it's not just technology. It's the people, the processes and the information that have to also be uh, worked together in a system that makes sense. And then understanding that you know, we have internal customers, we have external customers, the citizens, and then even uh, people around the world for certain uh, services that we have. Um, it is very important that we we understand that, you know, government's got to transform the way we do information. It's not just, oh, we'll buy this technology from this vendor and this technology, and that's going to solve our problems. We've got to be more, I think, more strategic than that, than just buying a product. It's the same thing in the private sector. I mean, every organization have to think about what they do, how they do it, who's doing it, and then find technology that fits that. Are you looking to reach technology leaders? Hosting a podcast does have some costs involved. I'm searching for sponsors on this weekly podcast to simply pay for the hosting, editing, and marketing associated with this great podcast. If you're interested in sponsoring the podcast, please contact me through Twitter or my website, and soon you'll be reaching technology leaders around the world. Kevin, what are you working on that is really motivating you or something that you love right now that you're doing? So I mentioned SharePoint a couple of times. That's one of the bigger platforms that the company I work for works with. And one of the greatest things that I'm seeing with that platform is this migration Office 365, also some other cloud services. But not only the benefits of cloud that we talk about and not having to manage infrastructure and all the kinds of things that go with that, but having to simplify the technology so that it can easily transfer over to the cloud version of it means that you have to rework your processes and things. And I, I just love seeing us clean that stuff up so that we're moving from, for instance, SharePoint on-prem uh, to SharePoint online in Office 365 and getting the clients to really simplify how they use the technology, not have to have a million custom coded widgets and apps, but use the stuff that comes out of the box and uh, configure that just to meet your needs. I, I like helping customers solve problems, get information to the right people at the right time for the right thing. And this is one way we're doing it. Do you find that when you're moving from on-premise to cloud, are you starting over from scratch and really evaluating it from the business standpoint, or are they giving you a list of requirements? We had all of this in our current on-prem, and we want this in the cloud. How are you approaching those situations? So I generally hear the latter more that says we know what we want because this is what we're doing and we want to put it up in the cloud. What I find myself as a senior consultant coming in saying, uh, you can't really do it that way and here's why, or you shouldn't do it that way. In the long run, this is going to cost you more time and money and you may never get it to market or to, you know, into production for what you're doing. So helping them go back and reevaluate, it, it's kind of tricky with government contracting because <laughs> they're they're pretty strict the way things are set up. We need this service. We're going to go contract for that service, and they have to deliver that service, that particular thing, uh, or that product, or a combination uh, thereof. And getting them to be flexible and saying, okay, we need this to be a little more open ended, not because we're trying to get more money from you, but because we're trying to solve the actual problems that you have. I'm starting to see a little bit more flexibility, but it, it's tricky, uh, just because we're all most of us, certainly the company that I work for and the clients that we have are trying to do everything above board 
and making sure that things are done in, the, in a proper way that can be vetted and audited and all that kind of thing. But that doesn't mean that they know when they send out the RFP exactly what they need to solve their problems. They typically don't, or they wouldn't need our help. When they do these technology projects, are they still thinking in a waterfall mindset, or are you trying to push them also toward agile sprint, quick delivery, so that you can get that fast feedback? Yeah, that has a big impact on, on how things are delivered and when they're delivered, right, and the quality and all that type of stuff. It really depends on who's doing it. In government contracting, there are often many different contracting groups that have different responsibilities, but with the same client. And so uh, one of the contracts that I've worked with closely at the Department of Justice, I am not within the IT organization directly. I'm actually within a business unit. And we're working with the IT organization. They tend to do some things in a more waterfall approach, but I'm starting to see, especially with our contracts, but many others, um, they're requiring some level of agile. Uh, they may specifically call out Scrum or some other methodology, but they, they want things done in a, a more agile basis. And it's important as a, a consultant that really takes agile seriously to help them understand that, that doesn't just mean daily standups and calling things, you know, scrum meetings, it means actually doing things in a more agile fashion. If, if you don't deliver something every so often, it's not really agile, is it? Uh, that's right. important for us to build that into the contracts up front in our proposals. Hey, we are going to deliver, you know, this thing to meet these business needs, but we're going to deliver it in iterations throughout the course of the project. And so I'm starting to see more of that. Are they taking uh, the concept of being that product owner? Are you having to train them to really understand rather than give me the list of 100 things, prioritize, let's work on the top 10 things, and let's also work on the back end, the technology infrastructure? Because I find that they don't know how to organize that piece. Right. So it really it depends on the experience and the sort of savvy of the person, the federal contracting officers and whoever are the product owners, as you're saying, but for them, those who've had more experience with Agile and, and how to lead these types of projects uh, do better, but most of them rely on us as consultants to help them, which is fine. Uh, as long as we're getting someone who is you know, trying to be that product owner, we have great clients uh, with the contracts that my company works with that really trust us and want us to help them deliver the right products. So they also listen when we try to train them to you know, know what is a product owner and what, what are the end goals. And so we have some flexibility there, which is really great. But there are times, uh, you mentioned you know, listing those requirements. I, I've worked for some contracting officers and project managers who just really wanted to list down you know, their hundreds of requirements and thus to do this requirements traceability matrix and all these fancy things that ended up just these long convoluted documents that didn't go anywhere. So we try to do Agile in a way that makes sense with the user stories and with actually documenting things. Agile doesn't mean you don't document, although some people seem to think that. Uh, but we document these things that actually need to happen in the clearest, simplest, most concise way possible, and then actually go execute those things. We get so much more out of value, and they get more value out of our work uh, doing it that way. With the projects and the successes that you have, do I know you're working with the uh, the AIM group in DC and that you also do some uh, speaking and training. What do you really focus on? Because I, I know that I generally will bring out those lessons learned from my projects as I'm mentoring and talking with other people. So what do you like to put out there to the world as to improve themselves? When I speak and when I write, and as you mentioned, teaching and some other things, uh, I one of the things that I really try to get across is that technology really isn't by itself the solution to your information management problems. And that the solutions themselves are not things that technology vendors can sell you in a box or a digital download, even though that's what they want to sell you. And I no beef against vendors. We need the technology. I was a vendor. I had my own products for years with uh, web content management. Uh, but if, if they had their way, oftentimes, they would tell you everything that they've got, you know, and that may or may not solve your problems. Really, the real requirements for an IT solution should be your strategy, your architecture, and your governance needs. And then couple that together with how do you change uh, from what you're doing now to 
what you need to be doing and get users to adopt. So it's really the people and process part of the technology solutions that I think a lot of folks don't see, or if maybe they started from business and they see that, but they don't know the technology as well, or they started in IT and they don't really see the business side as well. I try to help them really see that bigger picture so that they can understand their piece in it better, if that makes sense. Oh, it does. You have some amazing perspective on what's really key to driving uh, both technology in the right direction and not focusing on it, uh, but also where people should be focusing on. And I really am fortunate to have you have joined me on my podcast. I wanted to see what is the best way you'd like people to reach out to you if they have any questions or want to connect or want to find out more about the company you're with. So for me, the best way to connect is through Twitter publicly. It's uh, my first initial J, Kevin Parker, all together uh, on Twitter. And I'm also on LinkedIn with the same handle. But uh, connect with me on Twitter and I can point you to the other things. My website is jkevinparker.com. It actually has all my social links right there. And the company I work for is Neostech, N-E-O-S-T-E-K.com. And we only do work with the federal government right now, but I, through Neostech, get to go and speak at other places uh, and at conferences and whatnot. So I would love to connect with anybody that has questions. Great. Thank you so much, Kevin, for joining me. Thank you. I want to thank you so much for listening today. If you love this podcast, please do share it with your friends and colleagues. And please leave a review on iTunes, Google Play, or Stitcher because it makes a difference for circulation. For the show notes and other great info, enter your email into the mailing list at techleaderstoday.com. Thank you.